Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 57 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of May 17th to 23rd, 2012. Uh, my name is Larry Erickson and I'm the host around here. And for the next nearly half hour, I'm gonna be ranting at you, talking about things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention. Uh, that uh, if any of this stuff is interesting to you or you think deserves a response, a applauded or a criticism, whatever, you can co contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Um, I do ask if you email me that you include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. I do answer my email, but sometimes it'll slow about it. If you didn't catch the email, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there. Also, at the website, you can find sources that I used in the course of doing this show. Well, I'm going to start this week by going back to something I talked about last week. Um, uh, I last week referred to the commons in talking about uh, uh, Representative Paul Ranton's new Republican budget. I talked about an attack on the commons, and I um, thought I had talked about this before, but apparently it appears that I haven't, so I thought it deserved some more attention. Uh, first, a, a little definition. One of the definitions of common is referring to the community as a whole, the public. It's one of the definitions. Historically, the idea of the commons uh, traditionally referred to shared economic resources, shared by an entire community. Most often that was land, which most often was used for pasture animals, but sometimes involved the use of, of farming. Uh, this, um, the commons could also include like fishing rights and the rights to take game on this land and so on. Now in England, this practice dates back at least to medieval times. Um, but under the complex system of land ownership that existed in England, where there were literally layers of ownership with increasing security of ownership. There was, there was uh, fife hold and there was leasehold and there was freehold and you don't want to know. Uh, just suffice it to say that there were like layers of ownership. Uh, and under this system, this common land was actually not owned by the community. It was owned by the Lord of the Manor. Now, over time, and particularly starting in the late 1500s and through the 1600s into the 1700s, these lords found it more and more profitable to enclose this land. This process was called the enclosures. And sometimes that involved literally fencing off the land. Other times it was like a legal enclosure. Uh, but in either event, this disrupted the relationship that the people had to the land and what had been a common resource available to all now wasn't. The result is that a lot of people just literally got forced off their land. Uh, now, there were several waves of these enclosures. There was one in the 1500s, one in the 1600s. In fact, uh, in the early 1600s, I'll show you how disruptive this was. In the early 1600s, there were two armed peasant revolts because of enclosures. But um, elite opinion, which really meant the opinion of the lords, uh, the elite opinion favored enclosures because it was more profitable for the landowners. And so by the 1800s, this idea of the commons had been reduced pretty much to a handful of city parks. Now, in the US, we have a few examples of what could be called the commons. One obvious one is Boston Common. It's an obvious one. That actually was used as a cow pasture from the 1630s until 1830, nearly 200 years. Another one is uh, Sheep Meadow in Central Park in New York City. Now, in 1858, there was a design competition for, um, for the design of Central Park. This competition was won by two men, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, a name I'm sure you know, and a man named Calvert Vaux, or Vaux, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his last name, they won this competition. The thing is, part of the park, by the rules, was supposed to be set off as a um, parade ground for military training. But after they won this competition, they convinced the park's commissioner that a military parade ground was incompatible with the idea of this park, and they dropped it. And so from uh, 1864 until 1934, a period of 70 years, 
uh, sheep meadow was a sheep meadow. And I love this photo. That is a photo of sheep grazing in sheep meadow in Central Park. All right, but things when I talk about the commons, I'm actually using the term in a rather broader sense than that, that traditional economic one of shared resources. In fact, there's a more modern sense of the commons, uh, which, um, which refers to, uh, it includes things like literature, the arts, information, and heritage sites, as they're called. Heritage sites are sites that are um, important culturally or historically to a nation or a society. Examples in the U.S. could include things like, you know, I suppose, Old North Church, uh, the Statue of Liberty, the Washington Monument, the Grand Canyon, things like this. But I'm using uh, the commons in an actually even somewhat broader sense in the way I intended. I'm thinking of a, of a philosophical commons, if you were, a, a social commons. The idea that there is a public sphere in which all can participate, all have a stake, all have a part, and all have some responsibility. It's that space of socially shared and mutual duty, uh, duty that area in a society of resources which are, or at least by right should be, equally available to all. What I said last week is that this idea of the commons, the idea that there are common uh, interests and mutual responsibilities between and among all the citizens of a society, that that idea of this responsibility and accord simply by being in that society, the idea of a social contract uh, between the people and the government as well, that this idea of the commons is under attack from the right wing. Now, it's true that that sense of the commons has probably always been under attack from the elites in our society. It's also true that prob that's probably true of every society. Um, elites in any society, uh, they don't like the idea uh, that everyone has a stake in that society and therefore is deserving of some of the benefits of that society. And nor do they care the, for the idea of everyone having responsibility because that means they have responsibilities to others that is other than those self-imposed ones of noblesse oblige, which are, those are really intended to just allow the elites to show how superior they are to everyone else. The thing is though, and what concerns me, is that the intensity and the range of the attacks on the, this idea of the commons, for us, we are seeing an unprecedented level of attack. One example is uh, the attacks on the franchise, on the ability of people to vote People here referring mainly to the young, the poor, the elderly, and minorities, or those rather that uh, the people who are in the eyes of our lords of the manor, the wrong sorts of people. Now, I've talked about this before. I will talk about it again. Right now, I just wanted to mention that um, this move to limit the franchise just got another boost in New Hampshire, the state that continues to embarrass the rest of New England. Uh, the state legislature in New Hampshire is considering a bill to require voter ID. Uh, they had just passed an amendment to cut down the list of acceptable IDs, making it even harder. The thing that struck me about this is that those people in New Hampshire are in favor of this, say, as all these people do, that it's necessary to combat voter fraud. And when people in New Hampshire say, well, there's no evidence of voter fraud in New Hampshire, these people in favor of the, of the ID laws, they respond by saying, and this is a quote, there is no effort to determine voter fraud in this state. Which means they're saying you have to pass these laws to fight voter fraud when by their own words, the most you can say is that you have no idea if there's any fraud or not. Meanwhile, the ongoing decades long and largely successful campaign by the right wing to turn the words government and taxes into words to be spat out with unrestrained contempt. That attack is being broadened into an attack on the very concept of a public that is a whole community economic sphere. Put another way, what's being rejected is the very idea, the very root idea of an economic commons where there exists, at least philosophically, at least hypothetically, uh, a notion that society as a whole and every member in that society is required to have some measure of responsibility to see to it not only 
that no member of that society is, is, is completely destitute, but also that no member of that society w is without the means to improve their economic condition. I mean, j just consider a, a, a simple idea, just, just to illustrate this point. How long ago would we have greeted with hoots of derision the claim that public school teachers are just overpaid part-timers whose workday ends at 2 p.m. and are just ripping off the public treasury. But now the, exactly these kind of attacks have been and are being made. They're becoming this, this, this kind of, of, of demonizing denunciation is becoming common currency among the right. There are attacks on teacher tenure and uh, laws to to privatize public schools, and I said that doesn't mean to have private schools. It means to turn public schools into private schools. There are such laws in the legislatures in about a dozen states. And that latter, that the thing about those laws, that really shows what's going on here. That reveals the unspoken desire here. It reveals the unspoken objection here, because the problem for those making these attacks does not lie in the word school. It does not lie in the word teacher. It lies in the word public. The problem for them lies in the fact that public schools are done through government, that it's the nature of a whole community undertaking, one the community as a whole ha has a responsibility for. It's hard to estimate the, 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 the importance, the potential impact of this targeting of the commons. It's hard to underestimate the potential impact on us as a society. Yet at the same time, it's, it's kind of hard to make crystal clear what this shift, this recent shift in attack involves. So I'm going to try it this way. This goes beyond the idea of advocating small government or advocating limited government or advocating a government who was it? Was it Grover Norquist who said he wanted a government so small he could drown in a bathtub? Whoever it was that said that. This goes beyond arguing about whether or not uh, it's a good thing for government to uh, be involved in this or not, or even whether it's legitimate for government to be involved in this or that. This goes to an attack on the very legitimacy of the idea of government as existing to serve the commonweal, as existing to serve the whole society. It goes to an attack on the very legitimacy of the idea of government of, by, and for the people. It actually goes to the very legitimacy of the concept of the government as an instrument of we the people. In fact, it goes to an attack on the very legitimacy of the idea of we the people itself. It, it, it's the farthest reaches of libertarian daydreaming that are being advocated here. Daydreams souped up and mainstreamed by powerful voices that stand to gain by this change. And daydreams that are even stripped of the, of the classic libertarian fantasy that voluntary private charity will take up the have-nots. Stripped of that because even that involves a principle of a responsibility of the haves to the have-nots. And it's that idea of responsibility that is exactly what it is they're denying. We're going to take a quick break here, and I'll be back. That idea that I was just talking about, about an economic commons and the loss of an economic commons, the denial by some that even exist. That's marching in lockstep. It's only part of the attack because it's marching in lockstep with a denial of a political commons. Uh, moves being undertaken to limit participation in the political process. Um, not just the voting restrictions, there is the power of money in politics where overwhelmingly the people with the most money win elections. Um, but there's also new restrictions on the right to protest, the new restrictions on the right of peaceable, peaceable assembly, new attacks on our privacy, new attacks on even the Fourth Amendment, all of which I promise I will get to next week. But there have even been calls to change our understanding of the 14th Amendment in order to change our understanding of who is a citizen. Now that's really the point here. It's really the point because none of this 
it's, it's not the idea that these dreams of the right wing will be immediately fulfilled or even in the immediate future. It's rather that what was not that long ago would have been thought madness is now supposed to be considered within the bounds of normal, reasonable political discourse. Even the baseline notion of who is a citizen is now supposed to be up for debate. Now that challenge may, not, may well not succeed. In fact, we haven't heard any much about it in the last year or two, but that challenge is there. It has been raised and it's been raised not by fringe voices, no. We're talking about powerful people in powerful positions. Senator Mitch McConnell, fish face, he has said that he wants to have Senate hearings on changing our understanding of the 14th Amendment. And this is happening. It's happening. Not only a time when the gap between the rich and the poor is growing, but the gap between the rich and everybody else is growing. And it's, the point is, it's growing faster and faster, faster and faster. Um, the top 1% of our population has done progressively better in each economic period of growth and recovery. The Clinton era, uh, Clinton era uh, expansion, the Clinton era recovery, 45% of the total gains in income went to the richest 1%. Under the Bush recovery, it was 65%. Under this so-called recovery, it's 93% of all of the income gains have gone to the richest 1%. In 2010, the most recent figures available, the average income of a household in the richest 1% went up over 11%. The average income for a household in the bottom 99% went up $80. Not a week, not a month, a year. And the thing is, we tolerated this kind of thing as a people because we cling to this touching fantasy that with some hard work, a little pluck, and a little luck, we can join the rich in their yachts and their country clubs. That is a dream enthusiastically pushed, endorsed, underwritten, and cheered on by our lords of the manor who know better. In 1952, only 8% of people in a, in a poll disagreed with the assertion that there, was, that there was plenty of economic opportunity in the United States. That is only 8% said there's not a lot of economic opportunity. As recently as 1998, it was only 17%. Now maybe that is finally changing. Maybe people are finally waking up. In a poll last fall, 41% of people said there's little economic opportunity in the United States. That's two and a half times what it was 13 years earlier. Now, Lord knows there's enough wrong with this country and our heritage. But damn it, there are good things in that heritage as well. Uh, we've done much evil as a nation, but we've done good too. There are ideals that we fail to live up to, fail on a daily basis to live up to, but at least they are there for us to strive after. There are rights and freedoms, the privileges and immunities of citizenship. These have too often been transgressed and violated, but they have survived and even in some ways, although it can be hard to see at times, they've actually been expanded over the course of our history. But every day now, every day now, those ideals are under attack. Those rights and, uh, rights and freedoms are being shrunk and circumscribed. Those privileges and immunities are being stripped away, shredded, discarded, tossed aside by people more interested in their personal perks and power plays than they are in the benefit of the people as a whole more interested in their selfish interest than they are in what we as a people are supposed to be, what we as a nation are supposed to be. What we're seeing happen every day is sometimes done consciously and sometimes unconsciously in the sense of being useful idiots. But still, what we are seeing is a conspiracy against every notion of equality under the law against every notion of community responsibility, against every notion of justice, against every notion of fairness and decency. What we are seeing is an unfolding pat uh, pattern of betrayal. No, not betrayal. We are seeing an unfolding pattern of treason. 
against every decent part of our heritage as Americans. To undermine the commons is to undermine what it means to be a people. It is a despicable undertaking. An English folk poem from 1764 had it right. They hang the man and flog the woman that steal the goose from off the common, but let the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. I'm sure I'll have more to say about this. And again, I will talk about some of that stuff next week. But right now, I'm going to switch. We're going to switch to our occasional feature, Everything You Need to Know. And everything you need to know is where you can learn a lot about a topic uh, in just a few sentences. In this case, it's everything you need to know about why innocent people get sent to prison in just three sentences. One, last month the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that plaintiffs cannot sue government witnesses for violating their constitutional rights in grand jury proceedings. Two, Government witnesses already had absolute immunity from suit should they perjure themselves or commit other wrongs in trial testimony. Three, so unless you're going to assume the government is going to pursue criminal charges against its own witnesses, this means that police and other government, uh, government witnesses can lie through their teeth, secure in the knowledge that absolutely nothing is ever going to happen to them. And that is everything you need to know. And so we're going to wrap up today, wrap up today uh, with our regular feature, the outrage of the week. Um, you may have heard about this, but you may not have seen it. I wanted to make sure that you actually had. This involves a Florida man, usually described in news reports as an entrepreneur, who decided he wanted to make some money off of a current issue. So in the best tradition of good old free market U.S. capitalism, he'd produced a bunch of these. These are gun range targets depicting a faceless hoodie wearing figure carrying an iced tea and a bag of Skittles. The things that Trayvon Martin was carried, carrying when he was killed by George Zimmerman. I personally find it hard to express the degree of contempt I feel for this man, except to say that I have even a lower opinion of the people who, according to him, bought out his entire stock in less than two days. And as always, as always, if you want to really see the troglodyte brain in action, don't read the articles, read the comments. Read the comments. Uh, here are some typical comments um, that were uh, uh, from two different news items about this, two different news items about this, uh, two different uh, sources, I should say. One said that, you know, this whole Martin thing has turned into an assault against the white race. Another one said, I want a hundred of those things. Somebody else said, I hope he makes a million bucks off them. Um, one person said that they changed their minds about this whole Trayvon Martin business because Al Sharpton and the Panthers got involved. There is a number of them that called Martin in some version, uh, some version or another, a thug. He was a thug. He was a lowly thug. He was a vicious thug. He was a violent criminal who was stopped before he could commit more violent crimes. But one of my favorites was somebody said, Look, I see Trayvon's face in the hoodie. Too bad he won't smile. Ha, ha, ha. And there, of course, there are a lot of the usual, the liberals are the real racist comments because in the minds of these mouth breathers, to object to racism is racist. And think, think of several, there's, there's a guy who, who writes a blog that I read, and he has this phrase about, he calls it right-wing reading comprehension disorder, where people on the right wing just refuse to recognize the meaning of the words that are right in front of them. Several people said, oh, it's, it's just a target. It's got nothing to do with Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Yeah, well, here's the full description of this item 
when it was being sold. This is the whole thing. Everyone knows the story of Zimmerman and Martin. Obviously, we support Zimmerman and believe he is innocent and that he shot a thug. Each target is printed on thick, high-quality poster paper with a matte finish. The dimensions are 12 by 18, the same as narcotic zombie targets. This is a 10-pack of targets. In other words, the guy who made them said it was about George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. And yet still these people, oh, nothing to do with that. Another good one, again, typical of the way the right wing thinks. Somebody said, remember the Reagan and Bush targets? I don't, actually. I don't. Uh, I remember uh, um, Sarah Palin's gun sites. I remember the gun site that got mailed to me with a little note. I forget, I think it was, uh, we're watching you or we know where you are. I remember that, but no, I do not remember gun targets featuring the face of Ronald Reagan or George Bush. No, I do not remember these. The one good thing I can say about this is that sometimes there are consequences. Sometimes you can go too far. Uh, there was that Miami-Dade fire rescue official who said that, oh, young black men are being killed because of their, this is quoting, failed dirtbags, he didn't say dirt, he said another four word ending in T, which I can't say here. Their failed dirtbag, ignorant, pathetic, welfare dependent excuses for parents. He was just demoted two rungs to the lowest rank of firefighter. And somebody actually said, and this sums it up, what's wrong with these people? What's wrong with the targets? That's what, what's wrong with the targets? You know, I can't even call this the outrage of the week. It doesn't deserve that much dignity. That's it. I'm done. I'm through. Uh, we're going to see you next week. Don't forget the open house here on June 16th, 12 to 6. Um, and, uh, but for us, well, you just have the best week you possibly can. Um, I got my blood pressure down. In the meantime, we'll see you next week.